Thank you. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> Thank you for the applause. Hopefully you'll be doing that at the end of the talk as well. We'll see how it goes. Um, as he said, my name is Rogue Clown, Nicole, Nikki, Hey Blue. I answer to just about anything. And I'm here to talk about how to make the hacker community a little more welcoming. I mean, I've noticed that there's a lot of talk about we need more people to come to our meetings. We, we need more members. We need more people. We need some new blood. We need some new ideas. So there's a lot of talk about bringing people in, but not a whole lot of talk about what to do when they get there, how to make them stay, and how to make them stay interested. So that's what I'm going to be covering today. A little bit about who I am. Um, I live in Chicago. I am one of the founding members of Pumping Station One. I got in, where Pumping Station One is the hacker space in Chicago, for anyone who doesn't know. If you're ever coming through Chicago, please you know, give me an email, send me a tweet. I would love to show you around because we have a lot of shiny things going on there. Um, I got involved with Pumping Station One in December of 2008, before we had a space, before we were incorporated, before we were anything, and so I've seen it grow from the ground up. And I think more importantly to this talk, I'm still fairly new to the hacker community. I stumbled across the hacker community back for, for the first time back in February of 2008, a night of I'm bored, I don't want to do my homework, I'm going to click on Wikipedia links, led me to the page for a forum that a few of you may be familiar with, Phone Losers of America. And Stumbled across of that, started talking to people, you know, getting mixed up with that, made me hear about things like 2600 meetings, went to my first con, which was The Last Hope in 2008. Um, my first real life hacker community anything was a 2600 meeting back in June, I think, of 2008. So it's been less than two years since my first con. It's been less than two years since any real life interaction with hacker culture. So. I mean, I've been around long enough to get to know a lot of people, but I'm still new enough that the feelings of just getting started are fresh in my mind, and I wanted to share a little bit of that. What this talk is, this talk is just a set of ideas, a framework to keep in mind to make sure that your behavior and the, you know, what your organization or group does is as welcoming to new people as possible. It applies to informal hacker meetups, it applies to more formal organizations, hacker spaces, really any kind of group where art and technology enthusiasts or people in general get together and interact. What it isn't, it's not a step-by-step -step framework for implementation of being more welcoming. I can't tell each of you, say these words, do this step, do this, then do that, and people are going to stay in your organization. There's got to be some kind of personal touch. It's always got to be influenced by your own experience, because if you don't think back and remember what it was like to be new and incorporate that in making people feel comfortable around you and your organization, it's going to ring hollow. And if it rings hollow, people aren't really going to want to stay. They want to see the real you, and they want to see the reality of your organization. The other thing this talk is not is a claim that everybody who comes in or everybody who hears about your organization will want to stay. I mean, the hacker community is not for everybody. It takes a certain inquisitive spirit. It takes a certain personality to thrive in this kind of community. You've got to be self-directed. You've got to be curious. And not everyone is, and that's OK. A roadmap of the main points that I'm going to be talking about. First of all, your role. Because before we can talk about how to make other people feel welcome, you need to know what your role is in this. Whether you're new, whether you've been around for years and years and years, you're all here, so you all have some kind of role in making new hackers feel welcome. Secondly, I'm going to talk what, about what you can do within your organization, what you can do at your meetings, how you can interact with people to make them feel more welcome and more valuable. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about what you can do outside of the organization. 
you know, even though outside of the organization is a little, you think of that as a little more about publicity than about getting people to stay, there are ways that when telling people who aren't familiar about your organization about it, that you can impart that welcoming spirit from the start. And finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about the special responsibilities of organizational leadership because even though being welcoming is the responsibility of every member, people naturally look to organizational leadership, officers, directors, well-known members, for some kind of guidance about what the group is, how it works, and what their role in it is. So organizational leadership, just because of that natural tendency, does have some special responsibilities in this. First, your role. You're all ambassadors. Even though the hacker community is this global thing, there are you know, groups, hacker spaces all over the world, that's not what someone just wandering into it sees for the first time. They see your meeting, they see your hacker space, they see you, they sit down and talk to you one on one. They don't you know, sit down and talk to you and think, oh, I wonder what such and such in Berlin thinks about this, or in New York, or in LA, or anywhere else. You are an ambassador. And this applies no matter how long you've been involved in the hacker community, whether it's you know, your first meeting, or your first convention, or you've been around for 20 years. They're talking to you, they want to know what your, they want to know what your organization is about, they want to know what your role is in it, and they want to know what they can do from your point of view. I want you all to think back and start, how did you feel when you were coming into the community? I'm sure you were probably very excited, I'm sure you were curious as to you know, what these people were up to and what you could be up to, but it was probably also a little scary. I mean, I remember being I, I was really excited. These hacker people were, they seemed to be up to a lot of interesting things. They seemed to have a lot of knowledge that I wanted, but it was also kind of scary. You know, I still get that feeling, everybody here knows more than I do. It's inevitable in a group of really smart people and a group of people with really diverse backgrounds. And you know, also I was a little scared because you know, the hacker community, and even just the word hacker, there's this implication that it's somehow covert, under the table, oh my god, cyber criminals. I mean, when I was first stumbling across the hacker community, it was early 2008. I was in my last year of law school, I was about to go through the character and fitness exam, which is basically the background check from hell. I had to fi fill out this, you know, 35 page form and account for everywhere I've lived in 10 years and everyone I knew and all of my, just, it was insane. And I, the last thing I wanted to do was, you know, be denied my law license because I was associating with these hackers and they decided that I wasn't morally fit enough to go into the career. I was scared. <laughs> And of course this is really funny because now two years later I've decided, man, you know it would have been great not going to law school in the first place, but that's not what this talk is about. <laughs> if you're curious about that story, you can, you know, pull me aside at one of the parties and hand me a beer and I'll probably explain it all in excruciating detail. But basically my point is, that's my story. Each of you has a story, it's probably different than mine in a lot of respects, it may have some similarities as far as how you feel. But you need to stay in touch with that in order to best interact with people who are in the midst of their coming into the hacker community story. You all stayed. You're all here. You're all here at Nauticon. I'm sure most of you are involved in things at home, be it you know, clubs, hacker spaces, anything else. Why? I'm sure the reason you stayed at least boils down partially to the people that you met when you were first coming in. I mean, if they were all jerks to you, if they were all, you know, we're a lot more leaked than you are and we're not going to share our information and they closed you off, you're just starting out. You're probably not going to move somewhere else and hope, hey, maybe the hackers are nicer in this other city. You would have probably found some other outlet for your ideas and your creativity. and. Somebody made you feel welcome and somebody made you feel valuable enough to stay and believe that you had something to contribute. 
basically to make people feel welcome. They need to feel comfortable. They need to feel like there is something they can take, something they can learn, something they can get out of it, but also that there is something that they can give, that they're not just leeching and freeloading off of all of that cool stuff that you know, that you and other people in the community can get something out of what they already bring in. What you can do from within the organization. Basically, there are three things that I think you need to make sure to do to give people the best chance of staying engaged. First, teach new people. Second, learn from new people. And third, encourage others to engage new people. Teaching new people is probably the first thing that came to most of your minds when, you know, or the first thing that comes to most of your minds when new people come into your space. They're attracted to the hacker community to learn new skills. They hear about, you know, cool art projects people are doing or cool programs people are writing or cool exploits that are being dug up. And they want a piece of the action. They want to learn to do some of that cool stuff that you're doing. Cultivate that. There are both formal and informal ways that you can do that. On a formal basis, teach classes on a broad range of topics and aimed at a broad range of skill levels. I mean, you're inevitably going to have beginners, intermediate, advanced on any skill that your group is interested in. I mean, this is generally a good policy even to reach and continue to engage people who've been around for a while because you know, even though I've been hanging around my hacker space for a couple of years, there are certain things that I know how to do pretty well. I mean, I can make an Arduino pretty loud and obnoxious, but you know, how to use the, how to use the shopsmith, how to use the heavy tools, I have no clue. I haven't learned that yet. One of these days I may have a project where I need to build something and I'm going to need a beginner level class on how to use that heavy machinery under the loft. But if you have a class, if you have classes on a broad range of topics and a broad range of skill levels, of course, you know, within the umbrella of your organization, you know, a smaller niche organization that's specifically about, you know, programming Python or specifically about fabrics work may have a less broad range than a hacker space, but varied classes will keep people interested. Then more, in, more importantly, I think, even than the formal basis, because everyone thinks of, oh, let's teach a class. The informal basis, just one-on-one -on -one or small group conversation, social interaction. Offer to explain your interests in your projects. If someone new comes to the hacker space on a Tuesday night and sees you hacking on an Arduino and asks you how to work, how it works or what you're doing, don't say, oh, I'm too busy. Take a few minutes, offer to explain it, and you know, who knows, they might decide, oh, I want to get one of these and try it for myself. And even if they decide it's not their bag, they're not going to think they're too wrapped up in their projects to talk to me. They're going to think these people will share their knowledge. Maybe if this isn't my thing, I'm going to go talk to somebody else and try and figure out something else in the space that is my thing. It's just being friendly goes a long way to make people stay around. Secondly, which I think is even more important than teaching people, learning from new people. It's easy to think, oh, someone's new, they're coming in, they don't know this, that, or the other, we should teach them. But it takes a different level of thought to say, there's this new person coming in, they don't really know us yet or know that deeply what we're about, but they have their life, they have their experiences, they have their skills, and maybe there's something cool that I can learn from them. Implementing a culture of learning, again, can be done formally and informally. Formally, institute multiple formats for sharing knowledge and skills with people. Do classes, you know, longer form, either series or, you know, hour-long classes. But also, you know, there are some skills that can be explained in a shorter amount of time. Have, you know, for example, a lightning talk night. Like every, um, every second Tuesday of the month, I believe, at Pumping Station One, we have 300 seconds of fame where anybody, it doesn't matter if you're a member, a non-member, doesn't matter if you've been coming around for a year or it's your first time in there, you can give a talk for five minutes on anything you want. You can explain how to do something. You can you know, bring a musical instrument and perform something. You have five minutes to convey whatever you want to the group. 
And if someone's kind of nervous about putting together a class or a workshop or a talk, offer to help them out. Make it clear that you know if you're not quite sure where to go, but you have some knowledge that you want to share with everybody, someone will be able to help you do it. Because if you've got new people coming in and teaching classes, giving talks on what they know, it's going to diffuse the whole, I'm new, I have nothing to give, I don't know anything. Nobody who walks in there doesn't know anything, and sometimes the hardest person to convince that they know anything is that new person who's walking in there into this room full of smart people that they don't know. In addition to the formal basis, there's also informal ways to implement that culture of learning. Just ask people. Ask people about their skills, their backgrounds, their projects. Um, whenever we have a meeting at Pumping Station One, we have those twice a month, so first and third, third, or first and third Tuesday. One of the first things that happens before any business is dealt with is we ask, okay, who's never been here before? Who's never introduced himself at a meeting before? And you know, they stand up and they can say what they're interested in learning, but we also always ask, what do they do? What kind of projects are they involved in already? What their background is? Why they were attracted to it in the first place? And that gives the other people who are at the meeting an idea of, oh, maybe they know something about programming that I don't know. Maybe they know something about painting that I don't know. Maybe they have some kind of skill that would be useful in a project that, that I've already started. Now, encouraging collaboration is a really good thing. You see that on an informal basis for implementing a culture of learning on this slide. But you also notice you saw it on my slide for implementing a culture of teaching. Collaborating on projects is really one of the most important ways to make new people feel welcome. Because not only does it require there to be a level of social interaction between someone who's already there and a new person, it requires a skill exchange, it requires all of the collaborators on the project to feel that each other has something valuable to add to the project and make it better. And it really is one of the best ways to get new people entrenched and engaged into what you're doing. Finally, encourage others to engage new people. You can't just say, oh, I'm going to be friendly when a new person walks into the door. You need to be deliberate about it and you need to make sure that other people are on the same page with you because even if you're nice and friendly and leave a good impression, if the other people in the space are you know, too busy with their projects to care or you know, too wrapped up in themselves, it's not gonna make that, it's not gonna make as much of a difference as it could. You need to be aware of what your group's culture is. You need to express the importance of the teaching and the learning that I've already talked about. And make sure other people in the organization appreciate it. You need to recognize if you know, there are people getting exclusionary. And sometimes it's, sometimes, sometimes it's deliberate. Sometimes you know, people don't have a very good attitude towards new people. And Call them out on it. Don't be a jerk about it. Do it in private. But you know, if you realize that someone is being you know, abrasive towards new people coming in, you may want to you know, pull them aside, privately talk to them, and be like, look here, um, I, know, I know what you're trying to do. I know you do a lot of cool stuff. But you're not making people feel all that comfortable. Now, I'm not saying be the police about it or anything, but just sometimes, you know, all they need to realize that they're not being particularly friendly to new people coming in is to have someone that they know and respect pull them aside and tell them. Sometimes it's completely inadvertent. I mean, I know that I'm just as guilty about this as anyone else. I'm coming in, I'm having a bad day, I'm just like, I hate people, I hate you all, I'm gonna sit here, I'm gonna put my headphones on, and I'm gonna work on my project. Go away, don't wanna talk to anybody. <laughs> and you know, if someone comes in who's you know, seen me a million times before, they know the difference between you know, Nikki on a good day and Nikki on a bad day. But if they haven't been there before, if they don't know me and know what I'm about, they might see that and be like, oh, she doesn't care. So if you are going to be you know, at a meeting or at the space and there's someone new who comes in and wants to know what you're up to or wants to know what your interests are, 
take a few minutes. You don't have to you know, drop your entire project and spend the rest of the day orienting them to every little detail of your space or your community, but just a couple minutes to chat and you know, figure out what they're up to and figure out what they wanna know about you will really go a long way in making people actually want to come back and make people feel like a part of the community. Because basically, it is in everyone's interest to have a welcoming culture. It's not just good for the new people who are you know, coming in to decide, you know, oh, I wanna stay because these people are really cool and they're doing a lot of cool stuff. It's in your interest too. If you don't have these new people coming in with these new ideas, you may lose an extremely valuable, interesting collaborator on that project or a future project or just a good friend, who knows. I've talked about what you can do inside the organization, but there are also things that you can do outside your meetings, your space, anything else. Um, even though it's generally thought of as recruiting, it still has a you know, more long-reaching component of being welcome. First, build community, build connection. Don't only go to things for your organization or your space. Um, there's a lot that having a blog or trying to get news articles written about you or anything else, there's a lot that publicity can do, but on top of that, you need to put yourselves out there. Make a concerted effort to attend meetings. If you hear about some local group that may have some sort of interest overlap with your group, you know, make it out to one of their meetings or events or something that they have open to the public. Like if you're a hacker space, be familiar with local you know, computer groups or crafting groups or anything else that would possibly have people that might be interested in what you're up to. And then you know, when you go there, just talk to people. Don't be pushy about it. Don't pull over everyone and be like, hi, why are you going to this? You need to come to our space instead. We're that much more awesome. That's, that, that's not very nice and it seems like you're you know, steamrolling in and trying to supplant the other group. That's not cool. But what you can do is if they're talking about your projects, you know, talk about your projects too. Mention you know, where you do them or who you do them with. And you know, if they seem interested, engage them in the kinds of conversations I was talking about before. Engage them in the kind of conversations that you would engage someone who came to your space or meeting. Ask them what they're up to, ask them what their skills are, and start that exchange. So when they do show up there, not only do they know that they already have something that they can contribute to your community, but they have a good impression. They know that you're open, they know that you're willing to exchange information, and can expect that other people at your space are willing to do the same. That's, a, that's another thing, don't get caught up in semantics. I mean, I know that there's a lot of, oh, do we identify as a hacker? Do we identify as a maker? What do we identify as? There's a lot of that talk internally when you're trying to you know, start a group and put together its publicity spin. And sure, that may be, that, that's something that might be worth considering when you're starting a group, although, I mean, even then, Focusing on the commonalities is usually a good thing, but that's especially important if you're talking to other people. You know, if they seem kind of scary, it's like, oh, you know, I don't like that word, hack. I'm gonna shy away from that. You know, that's your place to be, that's your place to be open. That's your place to discuss, you know, hey, this is what I'm up to. We're not these, you know, scary hackers that are gonna break into your computer like, you know, mom told you they were. This is what we're about. Focus on your skills, focus on your projects, and you know, focus on what you all have in common. Because you know, people feel most welcome and most valuable when they have something to contribute and when they feel like there's some level in which you can interact in common. I will talk a little bit about public relations as well. Um, don't shy away from the media. Um, like I've you know, mentioned a couple of times, the hack, you know, hackers do have this rap for being, you know, it, it's, it's starting to dissipate, but 
there are still a lot of people who think that you know hacking is this really clandestine thing. Um, try to get media exposure for your group. It'll you know make it seem less clandestine, make it seem more open. Um, talk to reporters. Make sure that you know they spend time talking to you, figuring out what projects are going on. It's it's a way to reach curious and talented people, and. You know, just the act of seeing you know, an article in a newspaper, a magazine, a blog, just something that's open to the public will take away that veil of secrecy. And also seeing more publicity for hacker organizations, hacker groups doing cool stuff, hopefully it will inform the work of future journalists. You know, people outside of the hacker community will see that and even if they decide that you know, getting involved in your space or your meeting is not necessarily their bag, it will, it will expand the public consciousness of what's going on with your group and make it seem less scary for people who are wandering in from you know, the general public or you know, to the extent that geeks are mainstream, wandering in from the mainstream. Also, stand up for yourself if a news report does get something wrong. Um, it's important to it, it's important to get the facts straight. It's important that people see you know some kind of correction if the you know, if, if some reporter doesn't quite get what you're up to. I mean, the response if somebody does try to propagate negative stereotypes of hackers or hacker organizations. The response is not, oh, we're going to stop talking to reporters and close off, because that buys into the, we're for the few and not for anyone who has something to contribute to it. Stand up for yourself, write a letter to the editor, um, write a comment to a blog post, post something in, you know, even if they don't print your correction, post it to your public email list, post it to your blog. Do something to you know, clear the air and make it clear that, okay, we talked to this reporter, this is what happened, these are the facts they got right, these are the facts they got wrong. Even though that's not specifically applicable to talking to a new person coming in, it still will you know, make people more likely to check you guys out and get a realistic idea of what you're up to if they did read the article and the and if there's some kind of lie in there that makes them less likely to want to do it clear the air and start that open dialogue finally special responsibilities of organizational leaders like i said before when i was doing my roadmap even though organ organizational leaders do not have all of the responsibility to be welcoming to new people Anybody who ever interacts with new people has that responsibility. But that being said, people do look to organizational leaders to be just that, leaders. They expect the leaders of the organization to know what's going on and to reflect how that organization works. One of the ways that organizational leaders can make their organization as welcoming as possible is to just be transparent in decision making. There are certain things that are best dealt with by the entirety of the membership, but there are a lot of issues that are legitimately best dealt with by leadership. You know, filing, filing paperwork, negotiating leases. I mean, it's an issue of too many cooks spoil the pot. And, you know, or just day-to-day day-to-day you know, -day pain in the butt stuff, honestly. The, you know, nuts and bolts that need to get done, but not every member has to or not every member can do them, might be best dealt with by leadership. But that being said, the fact that not everybody can or should do something specific doesn't mean that not everybody can or should know about it. Openness debunks the myth of the hacker community as secretive. You can make your board of directors meeting open to everybody, members, non-members, directors, non-directors. Post the minutes of the meeting somewhere for everybody to see. In a lot of states, it's at least required for the minutes to be available to any member to look at. 
you know, in some it's even public record. I think it's a good idea to make the minutes of not only your membership meetings, but your board of directors meetings open to anyone to read at any time. So then people can know what the board of directors are doing, know it's not some dark cabal that they'll never be able to be a part of or never be able to influence, and will know that the board of directors or officers, or whoever's in charge, are acting in the best interest of the organization. It's important that whether it is a general membership decision or a board of directors decision, that people feel like they have a say. If they feel like they can influence where the organization is going, they'll be more likely to stick around with it because their input is valued. Even more than organizational transparency, even more important than anything you can do just organizationally, be personally accessible. That goes to that whole formal thing, informal thing. Not only do you need the structures to be welcoming, you need the day-to-day -day social interactions to be welcoming too. New people want to bond with the leaders of the organization. They want to you know, get to know them, figure out what their, you know, what the meaning of the organization is to them, why they're leaders, and how they lead. Um, one thing that you can do is have a membership liaison. Make sure that there is a point person if somebody is curious about the organization, if they want to check it out, if they have a few questions that need to be answered, have a point person. As important as that is, you need to be careful to not treat the membership liaison as the only leader to interact with new people. You know, sure, make them the point person for responding to you know, initial emails at your info at group.org address, or you know, make them the primary person to arrange visits or give tours, but make sure there are other people to pick up the slack if the membership liaison can't do it. And more importantly than that, make sure the membership liaison is not the only person that new people can come and talk to. Every leader in the organization has the responsibility to you know, talk to new people, get to know them, and fill in the information on the organization. Another thing about personal accessibility is you need to make it clear that you value their opinions for the organization's direction or role. I mean, outside of meetings, if somebody has a question and wants to figure out why the organization is doing something some way or has some kind of suggestion as to how better to do something, listen. A lot of times new people come in and you know they pull, oh, I'm only an artist if it's, you know, if they think it's a more tech-oriented organization, or I'm only a newbie, I've only been around for a couple of weeks, so my idea isn't as valid. That's not true. Leaders need no, no, it's not. <laughs> they do know shit. That's the thing. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> I don't think you need... You don't have to be able to push your way into the organization to have valuable skills. Sure, you know, someone may, someone may be like an awesome artist, an awesome programmer, but they're a little scared around new people. They may not have the, the social skills. They may not have quite learned to assert themselves, but that doesn't mean that they don't have a lot of interesting things to say or interesting things to contribute to projects. You should have to say, hi, I don't know you, I'm really scared, but I want to get involved, please, please, please have me. I, I don't think that's the best way to go about doing things. I think you're going to get a lot more, you're going to get a lot more talent, you're going to reach a lot more people and get a lot more people to stay in for the long haul 
if you welcome them with open arms. What about, GSF1? What about what? GSF1. GSF1? I have no idea what you're talking about. Geeks. <laughs> I don't think you need to accept everybody no matter how much of an asshole they are. I think what you need to do is give them the benefit of the doubt. Come in. What about the person who's just so that it's not another day? Um, we, we've actually had that, we, we have had that come up in our space. I know who you're talking about. Oh, <laughs> yeah, you do know who I'm yeah. talking about. And it happens. You, you, give them, you give them the benefit of the doubt, you, you know, let them come around, see what they have to offer, and if it's really not working out, if they're, you know, it's either a question of social ineptitude or you know, not following the safety rules, you sit down, you gotta talk to them and be like, okay, you know, we know that you have this, this, and this, and you can possibly make, you can make a contribution to our community, but, you know, certain members have brought up concerns. Um, there are some things that you probably need to address. And if they're serious about you know, addressing them and making the relationship between them and you better, then they'll give it a try. If not, then they'll probably go away because they're uncomfortable with you calling them out on why it's a poor fit. Um, you know, it's a, it's a very tough, awkward situation. I am, like I said before, I'm not trying to say that everybody should be part of the hacker community or that, you know, we do need to welcome, or, or that we do need to you know, stick with everybody. But everybody should get a fair shake to see if they're compatible with your group, with your organization, and make it feel like they have something to contribute if in fact they do have something to contribute, which many people do and just kind of discount inside themselves. In conclusion, discussion of how to build your organization must go beyond recruiting. It's not a question of how many people can we get inside our doors. It's how many interesting people can we get to stay inside our doors. And remaining focused on the concerns and outlook of new people in mind will lead them to feel more valuable and comfortable in the organization from the first time they become acquainted with you. you know, just make them, make people feel welcome when they show up. I mean, what happens, what, what happens later happens. But if you welcome them with open arms, if you make them feel like they can learn something from you, if they make them feel that you can learn something from them, and you encourage everybody there to do the same, you're really going to go a long way into you know, finding these valuable, interesting, fascinating people that may walk through your doors and you know, collaborating and making a lot of really awesome stuff. Questions? Yes?
No, I I absolutely agree. I mean, the da the dangerous people are the ones that are they're, they're the ones that are as bad as it sounds, the easiest to deal with. If they break rules, if they use tools on an unsafe basis, I mean, that's going to be a you know a, a core rule of a space or an organization. It's like you're breaking the rules. You keep breaking the rules, and we're going to have to kick you out because you are a hazard. The ones who are probably the most difficult to deal with, who are are the ones who are not doing anything unsafe, but are being, you know, either won't contribute anything or are sucking a lot more energy out of people than they're putting into it. And I don't have the, I don't have the answer for how to deal with that. You know, you, you, you can talk, you can sit down, you can try to, you know, convince them that, you know, they need to, they need to cool it or they need to calm down, but I don't know the answer to that. Yes. Yeah, that's Yeah, that that's a lot that's a lot tougher. I mean, I remember I remember having to deal with that in college even, my college had a rule that if you were a student organization getting money from the student activities office, you had to be open to absolutely everybody. And I remember there was one group I was in that, you know, not everybody necessarily liked each other, but we all had a common interest, a common purpose. But there was this one dude who came in and was annoying and nobody could stand him and he did stupid things like get arrested for smoking pot in a train station in DC on inauguration day. <laughs> Again, another story that I can, you know, tell in great detail over a beer. It's, you know, not relevant to this talk. But that being said, um, what we, you know, what we did in that context, we couldn't kick him out of the group, we couldn't kick him out of the community, but we could call him out on why, I, I think the most you can do is call them out on why they're a bad fit and they'll either have to decide to change their ways or go away. And you know, there's no perfect or perfectly nice way to deal with it, but that's about the best you can do in my opinion. Well, yeah, that's what I mean. I don't say, uh, yeah, that's, that's what I meant to say. Thank you for clarifying. Don't say, oh, you know, you're a bad fit, but say, this, this is why. This is what you're doing to undermine what the, what the group or the community is trying to do or trying to strive for and either try to fix that counterproductive behavior or maybe your talents would be better utilized elsewhere. Yes? I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't think that I don't think that necessarily follows. I mean, we are, yeah, sure. There's, there's a lot of fringe element here, but we're not, we're not the only part of the fringe. Or they may be, you know, extremely annoying, extremely taxing, but not necessarily going to flip out. Yes. No, that's that's definitely important, and you know I think that if you, that, that's that's another thing that I didn't didn't 
think to bring up in this talk and probably should have is you need you do need to be you need to be conscious of that you need to have a space you need to have a culture of being able to discuss differences being able to you know argue about them argue the merits figure out you know what you're going to do in difficult situations but a culture of doing that civilly and if somebody is new and sees that people do have that space to disagree it's something that you know e even though it sounds kind of counterintuitive because you know it involves it involves fighting it involves disagreement people will feel more welcome if they know that their opinion is valued and they can debate about it with people who are going to evaluated intelligently. Yeah, and it's, you know, you, you raise a good point with there being people there and then deciding to split off hacker, maker, or, you know, down some kind of schism, start new organizations. Um, I think that there's room enough under the umbrella of the larger hacker community for there to be all different sorts of, you know, groups, spaces, flavors of it. And, you know, what what it goes back to is these people care enough to start an organization under you know some some subset of the hacker culture but none of them would be there to be starting those new organizations if somebody didn't make them want to stick with the community or some facet of it in the first place i think your hand was up first back there <laughs> Um, I don't really, I don't really see the merit in the we're going to beat you GTFO anymore. I mean, there even, I think there's enough of a barrier to entry without that. There's enough of figuring it out and building one's skills because I think there's a difference between you know, 
getting involved in some kind of organization and you know becoming a person who is I guess one of the more respected members. I mean, you still have to prove your chops and you still have to show that you can do something creative or you can do something cool in order to gain any kind of widespread respect in the community. I'm not saying that everyone is ever going to make it up to that level, but as far as the barriers to entry, as far as you know, being able to start talking to people and learning when they honestly want to learn something. I don't think GTFO noob is particularly constructive. You know, it can be as simple as, oh hey, um, I, don't have the, I don't have the time to explain that, that's a huge topic, but check out this website or check out this book. This was really helpful to me. I mean, it doesn't take a lot, like in the time it takes to say, shut up noob, go away, you can say, yeah, that book with the Python on the cover is awesome and you should totally read it. And you know it leaves two different tastes in their mouth. Thank you. That's a, yeah, I mean, that's, I, I think that's a lot of why I don't think the whole GTFO noob idea has any merit, because the people who are, the, the people who are socially go get them enough to get past that are not going to be scared away if people are friendly, whereas if you're shy but you have a lot of skills, GTFO noob is going to, you know, scare you away and not expose you and your cool skills to the community. You, you, you have nothing to lose and more to gain if you're friendly. Yeah, there is that there is that kind of culture there and there's still you know even even nowadays there's an element of you know one-upmanship in technical skills and there's some good to come out of trying to one-up each other's technical skills I mean it pushes there's an element of that that pushes you to be better but that being said there's a difference between you know some good-natured sniping back and forth or, you know, oh, you know, I'm awesome because I can do this, that, and the other, and scorning somebody for coming in and not having those skills yet because, you know, they come in because there's something that they want to learn. And sure, there's, th there is room for that, but it shouldn't be completely pervasive. Um, you shouldn't scorn somebody new coming in who honestly wants to pick up those skills because who knows give them like you know two years or three years or five years and they're going to come up with something cool maybe they're going to you know end up being better than you and people see that as a threat people see that as a scary thing and that's the kind of mindset that needs to change instead of seeing it as you know a threat or seeing it as a one-upmanship more push each other to be better, push as many people to you know, learn the skills as want to honestly learn them as possible and everyone's gonna get better. Um, there were, we can come back to you if there's time, but there were several other people who had their hands up and wanted to ask. I saw, Reese, I saw your hand up before.
Did I see a hand up over? Oh, is that? Thank you. <laughs>